Hello everyone, I am Lavi Hilda Bicarbos from Casalia House Zambales. I work as a senior high school teacher at Casalia House National High School. I love teaching because it gives me joy and excitement meeting learners in different parts of the country. In my class, I work with wonderful enthusiasm and positivity. I'm interested in many different topics and I'm happy to focus on my learners' goals. So let's start. For our lesson objectives, you are expected to understand how to first define what is statistics, understand statistics key concepts, determine the essential processes involved in doing statistics, identify data and to classify them, and the last one is to use appropriate scales of data measurements. Let us now define what is statistics. Statistics is the science that deals with the collection, organization, and presentation, analysis, and interpretation of all kinds of data pertinent to the study being considered. With regards to what is happening right now in our country, which is the COVID-19 pandemic, has brought into full view the value and importance of statistics. Statistical data drives a myriad of decisions that impact the lives of the people and worldwide. In this period of the novel coronavirus global pandemic, COVID-19, statistics are required to track the status of the pandemic and its economic and social impact, reinforcing its value to society. Statistics as a science of learning provides an essential service to making available data for decision making in the face of uncertainty. So this is how important statistics is in our daily lives, especially at our present time with the pandemic that we are experiencing right now. There are two types of statistics. Number one, the first one is the descriptive statistics. It is a group of statistical measurements that aims to provide the basic characteristics of a data through tables and graphs and other descriptive measures such as measures of central tendency, measures of position, and measures of variation. Let's first clarify the main purpose of descriptive data analysis. It is to help you get a feel for the data, to tell us what happened in the past, and to highlight potential relationships between variables. In a nutshell, descriptive statistics just describes and summarizes data but do not allow us to draw conclusions about the whole population from which we took the sample. You are simply summarizing the data with charts, tables, and graphs. So for example, you, you perform You perform A survey of 40 respondents about their favorite car color. And now you have a spreadsheet with the results. However, this spreadsheet is not very informative and you want to summarize the data with some graphs and charts that can allow you to come up with some simple conclusions. So let's say for example, 24% as we have here, 24% of people said that white is their favorite color. For sure, this would be much more representative and clear than the spreadsheet. This is spreadsheet and we have a plenty of options to visualize data such as pie charts, line charts, and others. That's the core of descriptive statistics. Note that you are not drawing any conclusion about the full population. And uh, I would like you to keep in mind that there are also two main types of statistics, of uh, descriptive statistics, which is the measures of central tendency, or we also call it as the measures of central location. And these are the mean, the median, and the mode. The second type of Descriptive statistics is the measures of variability, which is the range, the variance, and the standard deviation. But we'll have a deeper understanding on these topics in a separate 
discussion. Now, the second type of statistics is the inferential statistics. Inferential statistics aims to infer or to make interpretations by making a concluding statement about the population based on the result derived from a data set. It measures commonly, uh, its measure is commonly used in inferential statistics, includes analysis of variance or the ANOVA, the t-test, the chi-square correlation, and the most familiar is the regression analysis. Conversely, with inferential statistics, you are using statistics to test a hypothesis and draw a conclusion and make predictions about a full population based on your sample. Understanding inferential statistics with examples is the easiest way to learn it. It is one bunch of statistics that is very useful in the world of research. It has a big role and of the important aspect of and of the importance of, in the aspect of research. Today, infer, inferential statistics are known to be getting closer to many circles, not only by students or academics, but the use of statistics is also often used by survey institution in releasing their results. Bawa, um, nag-take ng exam. So, those are uh, simple uh, uses of statistics. This proves that inferential statistics actually have an important role in our lives. Let's have an example. Examples of inferential statistics is a new milk formulation designed to improve the psychomotor of infants was tested randomly. And based on the result, it was concluded that the new milk formulation is effective in improving the psychomotor development of infants. So after the test, after getting the samples and testing it in the random samples, we get to conclude, we get the data, the accuracy, the, the data gathered will give a conclusion. We can make a conclusion out of those uh, the sample data that the milk formulation is effective in improving the psychomotor development of the infants. The flow of using inferential statistics is the sampling method, the data analysis, and decision making for the entire population. Inferential statistics are used by many people, especially scientists and researchers, because they are able to produce accurate estimates at a relatively affordable cost. Another example is that we often hear the assumption that female students tend to have higher mathematical values than men. Is that right? Well, to prove this, you can take a representative sample and analyze the mathematical values of the samples taken by using a hypothesis test. You can draw conclusions about the actual conditions. So this is uh, another example of inferential statistics. It is also of great importance to know the four essential processes in statistics. The first process is the collection of data. This refers to the gathering of related information such as what is useful and what is needed, where to go, get information, and how to get the information. The second essential processes in statistics is the organization and presentation of data. This refers to the systematic way of organizing data, and it involves the following, collecting, classifying, and arraying and presenting data gathered in preparation to analysis. The third essential processes in statistics is the analysis of data. This refers to extracting relevant information 
The systematic way of organizing data, it involves the following. Comparison and contrast, description and statistical measurements to come with numerical values and qualitative summaries resulting to conclusions. The last one is the interpretation of data, which refers to the drawing of logical statements from the analyzed information. This involves the following, generalizing, forecasting, and recommending solutions and interviews about. Okay, there are two major terms used in statistics, the data and the variable. The data is a body of information or observation being considered by the researcher. When data is processed, information, which is the basis for decision-making, is produced. For example, is a crop production. Now we have the variable. The variable is used to define certain observable values of, or characteristics. It is called variable since the characteristics vary from one another. Okay, so this is an example of variable. So they vary from one another, and the values of the variable are the passable observable values or characteristics of the variable. And these values are the data to be processed. So the data is crop production. All these things in the figure is an illustration of the, class, the different classification of crops. And they have different characteristics. Let's say the color, uh, the type of crop, different type of crop. So we have the vegetable, the fruits or the spices, the cereals, the pulses, and the oilseed crops. So all these things are a data about crop production and these are the different classification of crops. It is called a variable data since it has different characteristics. Now, there are different ways of classifying data. The first one is according to nature. It is quantitative or numerical data and these are those obtained from variables which are in the form of numbers. Example is the age, height, or amount. For crops, if you are talking about their age, age when a fertilizer was placed in the soil, the height when it was planted after two months, and the amount of crops produced after or on the time of the harvest, how many amount of crops were produced. The second one is the qualitative, or we also call it the categorical data, are those obtained from variables which are in the form of categories, categories, characteristics, names, or labels. Example is gender, socioeconomic status, or civil status. For crops, we can ask what kind of crops, the color of the crop, the uh, condition of the soil when the crop is first planted. So those are under qualitative or categorical data. Another way of classifying data is according to source. So we have two types of according to source. Number one is the primary data, which are first-hand information. So these are data gathered from a survey for the person who collected the data is the one using it. And the secondary data are second-hand information from newspapers or journals, economic indicators, and the data being used are collected by another person or another organization. Another way of classifying data is according to arrangement. So we have the ungrouped data, 
These are data without specific order or arrangement and they are referred to as raw data. Let's say, for example, data during enrollment. So we have the number of students enrolled in the senior high school department in grade 12 is 345. So let's just assume that it's 345. Now we do not know uh, where the track or the strand these students belong. So it is still ungrouped data. Another example of ways of classifying data according to arrangement is the group data. From the previous example that I have mentioned, these are data arranged or tallied and presented in an organized manner. So, when we try to group the data from the ungrouped data, which is the number of students enrolled in the senior high school department, we can now group them according, according to their track and according to their section. So we call this the group data. We also have quantitative data classified according to measurement. We call these the discrete data, and these are those obtained from counting process where data are whole numbers. Example is household size, number of cans of sardines produced. And we have the continuous data are those obtained through the measuring process where the data are values that may be decimals or fractions. Uh, example is inflation, weight in kilograms. Later on, I will be asking you to identify uh, if the data classified according to measurement is a discrete or a continuous data. So you might as well think of the different examples of discrete data and continuous data. Now, in e statistics. There are four skills of data measurements and also referred to as levels of data. Number one is the nominal scale. It is the lowest level of data measurement where the values for the variables are used for identification purposes only. And it does not signify any quantitative value. To record nominal data, numbers are arbitrarily assigned to each category. So that is the nominal scale. Example of nominal scale is the marital status in a survey questionnaire. They include the following values, single, married, or living with partner, widowed, and separated. To encode the responses or values that may be assigned as follows, I think this is not new if you have already... Uh, undergone practical research one because this is how you encode qualitative data. You encode the values and assign as follows, one for single, two for married, three for widowed, and four for separated. Another scale of data measurement is the ordinal scale. Ordinal scale has all the properties of the nominal scale but the number obtained also gives the order of the values. It is used only in variables that involves ranking process. For example, if the variable is possessions in the company, the possible responses may be managerial, supervisory, and rank and file. Managerial positions may be assigned a value of 1, and supervisory 2, and rank and file 3. I hope I'm not too fast and you are following. Another scale of data measurement is the interval scale. It has all the properties of the ordinal scale. 
the intervals between values in a set of interval data are consistent and meaningful, but it does not involve a true zero point. Furthermore, since they are real numbers, all calculations can be performed. For example, the IQ scores of students in a grade 11 students. So you can actually give interval on the IQ scores of each student based on uh, their class standing or grades. Next is the ratio scale, which has all the properties of the interval scale. In this level, there are, is a true zero, true zero point, and an absolute value of zero. And multiplication and division of measurements can be performed. For example, height and weight of students in a class. Please keep in mind that interval and ratio scales are the highest level of data measurement because all calculations involving the data sets are valid. You may still ask why is it is considered as the highest level of data measurement since interval scales have the characteristics of the nominal and the categorical scale and the ratio has all the category, the characteristics of all the other uh, scales of data measurements. So I have here an illustration of the various data classifications and their relationships. So in statistics, we say that we study about numerical data and this numerical data have two types in statistics or which uh, these data are what we call the data classifications where in it is according to nature so it can be qualitative or it can be quantitative under qualitative, we have the classification of uh, the four skills of data, data measurement, which is the nominal and the categorical, the, the, the ordinal. And then the quantitative is the interval and the ratio. This is very important when you are uh, applying statistics, especially on practical research too. So you must know uh, what type of uh, scales of data measurements are to be used. Now, under nominal and ordinal scales of data measurement, we have the random variable we call the discrete and the continuous, which is used in quantitative research designs. Okay, let us now have some exercises. Let us classify each item according to nature. Okay, number one, control number. Number two, marital status. 3. Number of children 4. Educational attainment 5. Occupation 6. Average gross monthly income 7. Years of service in the company 8. Number of hours spent daily chatting online 9. Number of glasses of water and number 10, extent, by which study habit affects the performance of a student. So I would like you to classify each item according to nature. So when we say according to nature, we have two types. We have the qualitative or quantitative. So you may write QN 
for quantitative and QL for qualitative. You may start now. I'll give you at least five minutes to finish this exercise. Okay, time check, 3 minutes. Time check, two minutes left. Just write your answers and we'll check your answers after five minutes or after the given time
Okay, class, last one minute. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, time is up. So let's now check your answers. I hope everybody gets the answer for number one is QN or quantitative. Number two, qualitative. Three, Quantitative. Four, qualitative. So that could be for number one, kung control number, it's a number, so it's quantitative. Qualitative, marital status. Um, the same with the examples I have given. Single, married, widowed, or separated. Number of children could be five, four, three, or only one child. Number four, education and attainment is elementary. So, these are in categorical form, elementary, high school, senior high school, college, or graduate studies and postgraduate studies. Then, we have occupation, which is a qualitative with different types of uh, categories and characteristics of an occupation like teacher, engineer. Uh, they have different uh, classifications. Next. Average gross monthly income, so that's income, and it's a numerical value, so it's quantitative. Years of service in the quanti uh, in the company, it's quantitative. Number of hours spent daily chatting online, so it's just specific, but uh, it is quantitative since it asks on the number of hours. Number nine, number of glasses of water taken daily. So, how many glasses? So, it asks the how. It's quantitative. And the last one is qualitative because extent by which study habits affects the performance of a student depending on whatever characteristic or behavior you can see in a student's study habit. So, I hope everybody got a perfect score. So, let's have another I want you to complete the table by classifying the data according to nature. So if the data is quantitative, classify further according to measurement. Okay. So I will again give you five minutes to finish this exercise. Your time starts now.
Okay, less than a minute. Time check, it's less than a minute. Okay, class, 30 seconds left. Okay, time is up. Pens up, everybody. So let's now answer. Again, I hope everybody understood the lesson. Hoping everyone will get a perfect score. So ID number of students according to nature is quantitative. So since it's quantitative, let us classify it further. According to measurement, it is... Ah, uh, wait. Diretsuhin muna natin. So, number of pages in a book is quantitative. Date of birth is qualitative. Model of cell phone used is qualitative. Number of text is quantitative. Daily allowance is quantitative. Computer rental fee, that's quantitative. Kilowatt hour used per month, quantitative. Number of students per class, quantitative. Monthly expenses in internet use, it's quantitative. So, you only have one answer for qualitative. So, it's continuous. It's discrete. Oh, we have two pala. Okay, then we have continuous. All the data according to measurement, if it is quantitative, it's continuous. Okay. And under qualitative, we have this group. Okay, any questions? You may ask your questions and write it down in the comment section. And we'll try to answer those next meeting. Okay, another exercise is for you to classify each item according to the four scales of data measurement. This is also referred to as levels of scales. So we have number one, monthly sales in a school canteen. Number two, zip code. Number three, is course in a mathematics quiz. Four, socioeconomic status. A, B, C, D, E. Name of password chain in the Philippines. Number six, number of class per period per day. 7. Time required solving mathematics problems. Monthly amount of gasoline used by the family. Favorite coffee shop. Number of sets of uniform owned. And I think that's the last one. Okay. The answer is ratio. Nominal. Ratio. Ordinal. Nominal. Ratio. Ratio. Ratio, nominal, and ordinal. Okay. Uh, next part is a group work. You can do this as uh, you can finish the dish and we'll check this at a later uh, time next week or next meeting. So I want you to Take note on this and or have your screenshots. Okay, are we done? Thank you. Okay, this is just a continuation of your group work. Okay, this is also a continuation of the problem given in opportunity for learning. So this is just a continuation and I want you to identify um, the list of data that could be collected maximum of three data for each question then classify the data according to nature 
And then if the data is measured, identify its scale and justify your answer. A simple justification will do. One sentence to two sentences only. Okay. So, exercises for each item will have okay, so we have five items you may answer if it is descriptive or inferential so you may write letter D or letter I if it is inferential D for descriptive and inferential I for inferential Okay, so the answer for number one is yeah, para hindi lang matagal you can write the whole another exercise is so number one quantitative number two qualitative number three quantitative So next one, we have, I want you to classify each variable as discrete, write D, or if it is continuous, write C, okay, and the space provided, or you can write it down in a separate of paper. So I want you to evaluate these statements. So let's answer. Okay. Number one is discrete, number two is continuous, number three is continuous, number four is discrete, number five is discrete. So for your for reinforcement, reinforcement of what you have learned today, you're going to apply social statistics, which is an introduction to quantitative reasoning in sociology. So, I want you to group yourselves into four and choose one topic of interest to your group with at least, at least five data that you think are important to know to gather about your chosen topic and then classify the data according to nature, source, arrangement, and scales of measurement. Presentation of work will be done next. Another group work which will be uh, done or presented will be presenting this next meeting for the same group that you have chosen so these are the guide questions for the article you may copy before I will give you the article okay so those are the questions and we have the article. Okay, so you may write your, uh, you may answer based on the guide questions provided. So you're going to present this next meeting. So this is a continuation of the first article. For article 2, 
These are the guide questions. Is the study experimental or observational? What are the given variables in the study? What are the qualitative data given in the study? Could it be concluded that the technology is not a big help when it comes to productivity? And the number five, based on the results of the study, what would you recommend to new companies or establishment to increase or improve labor or business productivity? So these are the guide questions um, so that you will be more ready in practical research too, and you'll be able to apply statistical this as the statistical tools that you are going to need and what are the questions or how you are going to formulate questions later on so this is just an exercise on the application of what you have learned today so this is now article 2 the latest research on low productivity says technology hasn't helped much so let's read Washington Market Watch, a key indicator of the long-term vibrancy of the economy. Labor productivity is not weak because of inaccurate government statistics or a failure to account for the rise of Google, Facebook, and the Internet, according to new research from team of Federal Reserve economists. U.S. productivity or output per hour of labor has been weak over the past decade, rising a meager 0.7% for all of 2015. This is down from the 2.7% seen after the World War II and through the mid-1970s and 3% during the tech boom in the mid-1990s through 2005. All things equal is lower productivity means it's lower growth and living standards. For years, economists have been debating the causes and even the accuracy of the slowdown in productivity. One common explanation from skeptics is that government statistics don't capture recent innovations like Google, Facebook, or the Internet. But in research published Friday for a conference next week at the Brookings Institution, David Bryan, an economist at the Fed, Jan Fimald, an economist at the San Francisco Fed, and Marshall Ring. Reinsdorf of the International Monetary Fund argue that Google and Facebook are more akin to television and what people do in their free time. So these developments don't impact business productivity all that much. The researchers said that there could be another wave of information technology revolution from cloud computing, the Internet of Things, and the radical increase of immobility represented by smartphones. But since the early 1970s, modest and incremental productivity growth has more often been the norm, the paper concluded. The researchers said they experimented with new measures for computers and communications equipment that the government doesn't use. On balance, using these measurements, the labor productivity is slowed down in modestly larger. Okay, so that will be your... Uh, homework and I hope you'll be able to submit and present it next meeting so that will be depending on the schedule of your class okay so let us now have a recap of what you have studied So these are guide questions. I want you to ask yourselves and answer these things. If you are able to answer these things, I do hope that you were able to learn something new today and understand and hopefully be able to apply this not only in research but in your daily encounters. So this is end of lesson one. Thank you very much and God bless you all.